And gentlemen, today we are moving on with unit number seven, and that is about the identification of risk. So risk identification process, as we have already discussed the risk management plan, and uh, we have outlined the whole mechanism, how the risks will be identified, qualified, quantified, responded, and all. So now uh, we are entering into the process of risk identification according to the guidelines laid out in the risk management plan we will be following exactly those guidelines that will try to identify the risks in it so the process uh, um, is to understand um, we have need to understand this process uh, of risk identification clearly outlining the various risk types sources categories and factors um, I, I hope we, I, we have already discussed about the risk types and sources and categories but we'll talk a bit more about it and factors that can be considered and what inputs, tools, outputs, all that is to be required for the risk identification process. So uh, the breakdown would be, we will talk about the purpose and objective of this process, critical success factors of this process, what are the tools and techniques, what are the, how to document the results and ultimately the detailed discussion about each one of the inputs, tools and techniques and outputs, methods, etc. Okay, before we can start dealing with the risk itself, we need to know what the risk is. Until and unless the risk is identified, we cannot claim to have done anything about it because we can't manage it, we can't qualify it, we can't quantify it. So therefore, we must be extra careful in identifying as many risks as possible. And as we have already studied, as early as possible earlier we identify these risks better it is for us because we are decreasing the damage which could be caused by identifying them later after the risk management planning as we did that has been completed the first process is this one and that is the identification of risk and this is naturally going to be iterative all the processes of risk management are iterative in nature and this is first one of them it aims at identifying all the knowable risks so the first option would be first try uh, when i am trying to identify the risk is to identify all the known knowns and my second priority would be to identify the known unknowns but naturally we understand that unknown unknown is something which cannot which cannot be found still we will we will be proactive, we will try our level best to bring any uncertainty or unknown risk to light. If we can bring it to light, it becomes known. You understand my point? So we will try our level best to know as much of risks as possible. No matter they could clearly be seen or not. It is, however, impossible to identify all the risks because naturally the only possibility of uh, knowing the future is with god and we do not have that capability but being human beings we are uh, we can be as proactive as we can we can be as intelligent as we can and we can explore as many risks as possible but naturally there is no possibility that we can identify all of them naturally over time when we'll proceed ahead in the life of the project uh, we will get to know of changing circumstances, progressive elaboration, and due to that, new risks will rise and we will be able to identify and, uh, and recognize them. And that is the time when we uh, can identify them. The level of risk exposure will change over time. Internal changes will also bring certain decisions and actions taken previously in the project may bring into light some other new risks coming up related to them or even unseen risks which could be highlighted with with the time that passes then there could be some externally imposed changes which also may cause us to identify more risks in future therefore we will keep identifying the risk throughout the life of the project but in the we start this process of identification as soon as possible 
purpose is to identify risk to the maximum extent that is practicable whatever is possible i am trying my level best uh, this was one of the questions also how much do we uh, put in effort for that we must put in as much as we can <coughs> remaining within the constraints given to us <coughs> we can dig down to that level if i have more time i can spend more time in identifying the risks and planning if i have less time then naturally i have to do everything faster moreover i have also told you that we may employ a certain techniques and tools by which we can do the things much faster so let us apl uh, apply those tools and techniques and try to uh, utilize the time in the best possible way by identifying maximum number of risks in the shortest possible time the fact that some risks are unknowable or emergent requires the identifier risk process to be iterative naturally we will keep identifying and ultimately one day some sometime those unknown unknowns may become visible repeating the identifier risk process to find new risks which have become knowable since the previous iteration of the process so this will continue when a risk is first identified potential responses may also be identified at the same time now this is very interesting when we are doing the deliberate risk identification process naturally we are collecting these risks from some stakeholders some people are telling us that this can be possible so whomsoever is telling you that uh, telling you or giving you this risk please try to collect the data from them some more data from them which should include what is what do you what do they think the potential response to that risk should be this is not going to be your final risk response but this is a very good point to collect the potential risk response right from the outset otherwise at a later stage i may have to get back to those stakeholders for collecting further data so as much data i as i can collect at the time of identification i must collect that so one of that is potential responses i also can um, ask more questions about what is what do you think is the probability of this this happening what do you think how much damage will it cause so maybe qualitative and quantitative data also if possible can be can be captured that is the right time at the time of the identification of risk but i am not making it a mandatory effort you may not get these information about every risk so at least identify the risk and try to capture as much data as possible why are we talking about the potential responses is sometimes the risk identified is an emergent risk and it doesn't have we do, do not have enough time to translate it into actions so if we i have got very less time and this risk is about to happen in a day or two and my risk analysis process may take a couple of days then probably i would rather go for the potential response which have been given to us i will quickly analyze that response and if that is applicable i should immediately take action according to that these should be recorded during the identify risk process and considered for immediate action in such action if such action is appropriate that is for the emergent risks where such response are not implemented immediately these should be considered during the plan risk response process so i have collected the potential responses right on at the outset for the emergent risks i may have implemented them immediately but for all other risks it is not necessary it is not mandatory for me to adopt the, those potential responses but they may be considered when i am developing the plan risk response so the, these suggestions may be considered and naturally i would select the best possible response at that time so we at least will have something to start with the objective of identify risk process are to identify and record a long list of threats and opportunities so there are two things in it number one is a long list that means you the list you are collecting of the risks should not be small should not be a couple of risks a few risks that is not a good practice at all try to capture as many as possible so do not be you know ashamed of a long list that would, i have got a very long list how it can be treated and this is 
absurd. This is not absurd. This is exactly natural. Uh, you uh, may have a huge number of risks identified, but naturally, once we, we are going to analyze them, we may reject many of them. But at, the, at least at the time of identification, you should not be uh, you should not be killing them. Just jot down all the possible risks, which, uh, which uh, whomsoever is giving those risks, please not note them down in the risk register. Do not delete anything. Do not uh, uh, undervalue any of the risks which have been given by anyone in the out of the stakeholders. Um, you will have enough time to reject risks at a later stage. So create a long list, number one. Number two, do not only collect the negative risks, threats, but also pay attention, special attention towards the recognition and identification of positive risk. These are the opportunities. And try to do them from every possible angle. Maybe you can start with a work package. Each work package, you try to find what are the risks to this work package. Maybe you start with a risk breakdown structure. Maybe you start with from every possible aspect, you must explore if there is a risk and that can be recorded. It must be jotted down into the long list. So word long means hundreds of risks or maybe hundreds and thousands or maybe millions of risks does not matter. That is that all depends upon how much is the time available to you. And uh, uh, as I told you earlier, there are means available by which you can have collected those this huge, this, uh, huge number of lists in a shorter possible time. Do not debate with each risk. Just keep collecting whatever the other people are saying and keep writing it down. We can debate it later. Make sure all risks are in a cause risk effect format. This is exactly what we I told you in the in the in the uh, in the beginning. Uh, risk is just not that it will rain. It will rain. It's not a risk. There must be a cause why why will it rain, and there must be some impact, some effect on something. So recognize the cause as well as the effect, and appropriately fix them together into a statement of cause risk effect. And you will realize sometimes. The thing you are considering as a risk is not a risk at all. It is probably a cause and actually the risk is something else. Maybe the thing you are considering a risk is actually an effect and risk is something else. So if you will look at it closely from the angle of the cause risk effect and later on when you will be debating about it, then you would know that uh, risks could be defined in a better manner. Not only identify the risk, but understand the risk very properly. And why are we putting it into cause risk effect format as if others can also understand easily. You see, you, you may have uh, uh, understood in your mind, but uh, this is not explained in so many words in the written statement, which is with a cause risk effect. You are not using this statement and you just have jotted down. It may rain. So nobody probably will understand when will it rain and why uh, why are we so bothered about the rain how is it going to impact my project objectives that is that is important if something is impacting my project objectives only then i will consider it as a risk number one number two it should be written down in a proper cause risk effect format and it should be properly understood and in it should be in a form that should be easily understandable for others who will come across this statement. Uh, we have talked about the types of risks and uh, we did talk about the business risks, which are profit, business uh, profit and loss risk and the uh, other was uh, the insurable risk, risk which is all, always in loss, which we call the pure risk. We talked about it. We also talked about the known, 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 unknown and unknown, unknown. Uh, in known, known, you, you remember it had a pretty much good total uh, uh, good certainty of happening uh, known unknowns were having some degree of uncertainty and unknown unknown we could not have conceived that is a total uncertainty and we we gave uh, various examples for that no known we said uh, death is obvious it will it is a risk but we don't know when we'll die so this is a risk we, i'm not sure exactly on what date i will die but because death is something which will definitely happen 
So I have total certainty that death will happen and uh, the uncertainty is when it will happen and naturally I can prepare for that. For an unknown unknown, unknown unknown, unknown that is like a disease which was never known before, it was earlier unknown unknown and now we know it but we don't know how to deal with it. So this is a known unknown, degree of uncertainty and something which has yet not been explored, nobody knows about it, like AIDS before it was explored, it was unknown unknown. Later once we knew some cases of AIDS, it became known unknown. So uh, we can also look at it from another angle that is the categories. The risks could be external or internal. The external risks which may impact you could be predictable or unpredictable. The unpredictable risk could be something which is not connected with any events like you know some regulatory change, some government policy has just been released which was completely it could not be expected and that is affecting our project. So this is an external unpredictable risk. There is an uh, predictable type of risk like which, is, which we call the market risk. The share price has increased. The dollar has gone down or things like that. So these are external but, but predictable because we could have seen how the market risk, is, market risk is increasing or decreasing and we could have predicted uh, when the dollar value will go down or up. Then we have got internal risks and that is those risks which are within our domain internally. There, there are technical risks and non-technical risks. Non-technical risk could be of management or administrative nature that a person will not be able to come on duty on a specific day or there might be some hurdles in performing some job. So these are kind of management or administrative risks. These are non-technical in nature. But then we have technical risks which are uh, specifically related to the design of the work we are trying to do. So we must also somehow protect ourselves from these kinds of risks. Identify them and try to understand them and mitigate them in some way or the other. And another kind of, uh, you may call it internal or external, this can, can be a legal risk and that is when we get into a contract with someone, with some uh, uh, contractor, then the contract we sign can be interpreted by both parties in different ways. So naturally, once we are you are negotiating the contract, you must take full care that it should not be misinterpreted. But anyways, both parties will try to mold it according to their own wishes and benefits and therefore there will be some contractual uh, you know, risks also which can be reduced if proper negotiation, proper, uh, you know, contract management has been done. So these are the various categories of risk. Coming over to the detailed discussion on the identify risk process. Um, as per PMB OK, identify risk is the process of identify individual pro project risk. We have all, already been talking about individual project risk. So at this stage, we are not concerned about overall risk, but how can we be concerned about the overall risk until and unless we know the individual risk. Although we do have a high level understanding of overall risk. When the charter was developed, when the business case was developed, the high level risks were considered. Some pointers had been given to us, which I can always use. So I start with identification of individual project risk and then we, we will uh, find the sources of overall project risk as well. And then uh, the most important thing is to document their characteristics. The key benefit of this process is the documentation of existing individual risks and the sources of the overall project risk. So um, uh, we may not know the overall project risk, but what could be the source of you know overall project risk? We may not be very clear about it at this stage of identification or more focus should be on the individual risk at that point. But if we can uh, find some source for the overall project risk and it, it is, can be pointed out, it could be written down. It also brings together information so the team, project team can respond appropriately to identified risk. This process is performed 
throughout the project so it is repetitive in nature this is iterative uh, and the inputs tools and techniques and outputs used for this process are shown here in this diagram i hope you can see that yeah i hope you can see it now okay so what all do we have in input naturally if i look at the major categories i need to have the project management plan i need to have the project document and now what do we have why do we have the project management why do we have the project document if you don't know i must explain that during during the planning the two major documents which are created are number one the project management plan and number two the project documents so everything which is created in planning is actually being divided into these two major artifacts either they form part of the project management plan or they form part of the project documents so what is included in the project management plan probably you understand what is what is included in a project management plan uh, Mohit can you help me with this what is included in a project management plan generally sir uh, project management plan entails uh, uh, your scope management plan mm -hmm. uh, management plan budget management plan and human resources management plan procurement management plan mm -hmm. and then the integration management plan Mm -hmm. risk management plan so okay. all of these plans to, uh, combines to form a project management plan mm -hmm. for, for the project okay well done i might have missed some yeah yeah you see uh, number one uh, there is nothing like budget management plan it is called cost management plan there is nothing like human resource management plan it is resource management plan uh, if we start from the very beginning uh, from scope scope has two plans one is the requirement management plan and then is the scope management plan. There are two management plans which are created in scope. Uh, integration is not a plan. Integration is project management plan itself. The project management plan is called the integration plan, right? So project management plan includes the requirement management plan, the scope management plan, schedule management plan, cost management plan, quality management plan, resource management plan, communication management plan, risk management plan procurement management plan and the stakeholder engagement plan so all of these how many are they uh, if i exclude project management plan it's the integration itself they, we have got nine knowledge areas left out of the nine knowledge areas scope has two plans the requirement management plan and scope management plan. so there are two plans there and eight others so there are 10 management plan minimum 10 management plans are included in the project management plan that is number one Number two, this also includes uh, all the three baselines. And what are the three baselines? Scope baseline, schedule baseline, and cost baseline. So all the management plans and all the baselines. This is the minimum required. There are some few other things which could be included in, uh, in the project management plan, like configuration management plan, like change management plan, like the uh, life cycle approach. Uh, like the uh, development approach of the project so these three four things are further can be included into that into the list of uh, the ingredients of project management plan um, and these are the things during during the planning process group all of these items which we just enumerated they actually go and form part of the project management plan we do create a lot many other documents also during planning and they may include just start from the scope um, what do we create there we create the requirement uh, document there which is nowhere to be seen in project management plan we created the requirement traceability matrix and uh, what else uh, okay these two things from scope are not included in the project management plan where where do they go they actually form part of the project document this project document is an archive in which all the interim outputs or artifacts are stored for future reference similarly when we go to schedule naturally schedule management plan is going to project management plan and naturally schedule baseline is also going to project management plan but in between these two we are creating what we are creating the activity list we are creating the activity attributes the milestone list the sequence network diagram 
uh, then we are creating uh, the duration estimates and uh, basis for the estimate all of these artifacts are going to the project document archive in cost our cost estimates and the basis for estimate also go for the project documents similarly uh, let's go to quality we created the quality management plan quality management definitely goes to the project management plan but it is not only the quality management plan which is created in that process there are many other documents artifacts which are created during quality management plan and they include like various templates like uh, you know the checklist and uh, inspection schedules and all that so all those things form part of the project documents then you can deal with all other knowledge areas every knowledge area will give its management plan to the project management plan and the uh, other artifacts which are created to project documents so project documents will have a huge number of documents lying in it in there the interesting part is that the items included in project documents are not executable they are just documents which were created in the way of final plan and what is the final plan final plan is the baseline and that is the scope baseline the schedule baseline and the cost baseline even in project management plan uh, all the ingredients you see there they are all not executable only the executable part is scope baseline schedule baseline and cost baseline rest all of these management plans the 10 management plans which are not all shown here in the input because they are not required here but all the management plans which are included in the project management plan they are there for providing the guideline about that specific knowledge area because all the instructions and guidelines are included in the management plans so the overall guideline in project management plan which includes all these management plans and the baseline is the executable part which will be taken care of when we are uh, executing the, uh, the project and when we are executing the project who is going to uh, execute these baselines and that is the integration process of direct and manage project work so direct and manage project work is directly responsible for for unified execution of scope time and cost baselines so that means that scope baseline is not separately executed our schedule baseline is not separately executed cost baseline is not separately executed they are unified into a performance me measurement baseline and the performance measurement baseline which includes the scope schedule and cost baseline are in, are executed together so the only executable part uh, in the whole story is the uh, are the baselines and now after this discussion just look at the inputs and see what do we have in the project management plan so these are not all the ingredients of project management plan shown here they are just those ingredients which may be useful for identification of the risk but that is not something which is a restriction that you cannot use any other input for example there is no mention of the stakeholder management plan so maybe stakeholder management plan can also be brought in anything which is a part of project management plan may be considered here but the major role played for the identification of risk is naturally the requirement management plan because the requirement management plan is dealing directly with the stakeholders and collecting requirements from them and therefore there would be a lot many risks regarding requirements regarding scope so uh, requirement management plan is important for me for identification of the risk then schedule management plan is the greatest source of risk because schedule is the most uh, vivid kind of a plan which keeps changing like a jelly it shakes all the time like a jelly and it can change every time therefore i must take special care and my, must try to under, identify uh, the risks in the schedule because um, all other management plans or all other knowledge areas whatever they do they actually are going to ultimately impact the schedule similarly cost management plan is as sensitive as schedule management plan um, and uh, the estimates of schedule and cost are you know integrated together especially uh, with the resource resource management plan also because schedule uh, um, estimate which you call duration estimate cost estimate and resource estimate uh, put together 
contribute towards the formation of the schedule network diagram and all that so therefore these three management plans are important for me quality management plan has its own importance because we have to have the process improvement we have to have a check and balance system um, audits and inspections of the quality and therefore uh, we have risks in the process improvement and other things also uh, risk management plan naturally we had created just created this management plan that is the biggest guideline i can have i am not saying that that the management plans which are not shown here they are, they are not required here at all this you can tailor from for your requirements whatever kind of project you are dealing with maybe you need some other management plans as well but minimal these are the management plans which will be required uh, almost by everyone then we require all the three baselines so these are the specific ingredients of the project management plan which may be required for identification of risk as far as the documents are concerned uh, assumption log as you, somebody mentioned yesterday also assumption log is important where does it get created the first time assumption log came into being was when the charter was created it came along uh, when the charter was identified certain assumptions were taken but this is not the only source of assumption log subsequently when we will be doing a lot many other planning uh, further assumptions will be taken and assumption log will even get populated more so i need to have this assumption log why because assumptions are the carriers of risk if i take an assumption assumption is something which i believe to be true although this is this i am not sure about but just for the sake of planning ahead or planning forward and bridging the gap of information which is not available i assume certain uh, certain assumption as a fact and then base my estimates according to that now what if this assumption goes wrong isn't it a big risk so uh, until and unless this assumption is proven right this carries the risk therefore this is assumptions are the biggest carriers of risk so i need to entertain assumption log as one of the inputs for identifying the risk cost estimate duration estimate these uh, uh, these and the resource requirements resource documentation these are also important sources issue log issue log will give us a guidance what kind of unknown unknowns can occur to someone so whatever has occurred so far and what are the indications what what can i find more can uh, more risks which could be identified seeing the previous issue log probably that can help us as well lessons learned register whatever lessons we have learned so far are from the previous project may also indicate us towards the identification of some new risks and as i said the resource documents and resource requirements and even the stakeholder register all of these documents can uh, point us towards some identification of the risk and again i am saying that there are many other ingredients of project documents which if available and are needed here could be included in the input so don't just think that whatever is given here is cast in stone uh, this is not exactly how we are going to be dealing with the project in project we are going to be highly flexible but all the doc all the uh, inputs or outputs provided here are the most possible kind of inputs and outputs and tools and techniques we could have used but this is not a final list then we have the agreements now what kind of agreements do we have basically uh, we are in contract with some customer not exactly the the project is in agreement with someone but my comp is in agreement with the with the customer organization so we have agreed on certain terms and we have signed a contract now honoring that contract contract and ensuring that everything happens according to that is my responsibility as a project manager and therefore i will see the risks which are there in that agreement then procurement documentation this is not related to uh, the customer this is related to the work which i need to you know outsource to someone else some contractor of mine will be given this job 
maybe he is to procure me some equipment or some material or he has to do some job for me this all what all maker by the cnv make those procurement documentation could also be viewed for identification of risks and then the most traditional two things enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets they will anyways be there for me to be uh, for providing me uh, some input to the risk identification now how do i do it what are the tools and techniques i have uh, the traditional tools and techniques we have is the expert judgment and the meeting you know naturally we had it in all the integration processes and a lot many other processes project manager usually uses his expert judgment and he gets in consortium with his team and other stakeholders and meetings are conducted so these two first and sixth these two things are generally normal and we, they, these happen in almost every process let us talk about those things which are unique here the first thing is data gathering it's not that we are doing the data gathering for the very first time we do data gathering uh, for various other processes when i am collecting the requirements i am doing the data gathering when i am identifying the stakeholders i am doing data gathering when i am identifying the activities i am doing data gathering but every time i am doing doing data gathering that is for a different purpose and therefore the tools used for data gathering may be different for various tasks again the three uh, three tools indicated here may not all be final they, i may need a fourth or fifth or sixth tool for doing my data gathering for a risk, risk identification i can i can add anything to the list to this list or i can subtract anything from this list but this is a guideline given to you so the first point is brainstorming brainstorming is my point which i said that no matter how logical you are still you have to go out of your mind out of your comfort zone think out of the box and be creative and think of anything which comes to your mind no matter how illogical it is let the people uh, think wild and come up with stupid ideas and jot them down, down as risks there is no problem getting these stupid ideas into your risk list which can further be refined we can delete them we can kill them we can do anything with them but for the timing please do not discourage anyone please do not snub anyone get all the ideas and get them all into the risk register naturally once you are going to formulate them into a cause risk effect statement some of things will not fit in and ultimately they will be they will be thrown out or maybe when i am considering one of such stupid inputs uh, i it may remind me of another better and more logical risk which i could not have come up to without reading this stupid remark so brainstorming is creativity is all about creativity and we have various techniques for brainstorming some are the individual level of brainstorming that an individual uh, a single person so thinks uh, by himself all alone um, tries to be creative and thinks out of the box so that is one kind of brainstorming and then uh, we have got uh, uh, brainstorming being conducted in groups creativity which you could call you can call it group creativity in which we somehow point uh, provide some kind of fodder for thought for these people to come up with some ideas and they uh, they think out of the box due to that unique idea which i am giving them and that unique idea may not be related that may not be logical that is exactly why i am calling it creativity or brainstorming uh, then a logical method is a checklist checklist is the most authenticated method for logical thinking in which we have the happenings of the previous uh, projects are the uh, from uh, getting it from the old lesson learned or the old document what all has happened in past i have created a checklist of all the previous risks and now i am just striking them down which is applicable to me and which is not applicable to me so this is a logical way of doing it then we can also get back to our stakeholders uh, whomsoever are giving us those this we can interview them we can collect data in many other ways this is this list is not complete 
data gathering does not finish with interviews we may have to resort to other means like focus groups and like you know um, uh, group workshops and things like that but you know once you understand you have to do data gathering you will define you by yourself which means do you want to use what kind of time is available to you and uh, 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 related to that you will decide how are you going to collect the data sometimes i will have two two less time i maybe you know um, i just have three hours to collect all the risk so how should i do it how can i collect maximum number of risks maybe you send out a, a whatsapp message and asks everyone to please send all the risks within these three hours so you may get a lot a long list of risks that, that way also but that is when you have do not have enough time you have limited time available so you can resort to any means then is the data analysis data analysis is that you try to dig down into into various kinds of analysis you do the root cause analysis why this is happening and what is the cause of that and ultimately that may indicate to some risk then you look at your assumptions and constraints and analyze them and see what can happen what good or bad can happen to you if that assumption doesn't prove right then you do the SWOT analysis which is normally done at the strategic level strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats are identified for the organization uh, you can identify the opportunities and threats here which are actually the risks opportunities are positive risk and threats are negative risk uh, the old documents can be analyzed to identify a number of risks from there as well then because you have to interact with so many stakeholders your team members and customers and all other people so you must have excellent interpersonal skills you must be very passionate you must be very courteous you must be very uh, you know uh, uh, having empathy and all that and you must have some good team skills you should be able to facilitate your these people as if they are comfortable in giving those ideas prompt list is yet another way of uh, having a checklist type of a thing you know when you go to market and you want to buy things and your wife has told you these items have to be bought you just jot them down on a piece of paper and those items written on that piece of paper will prompt you when you are shopping that these items are to be bought and not only that but they can even prompt you for buying some related goods to those items shown in list so this prompt list could also be used as a kind of a checklist and ultimately the meetings you can you can have short discussions do not have very lengthy discussions with your team short discussions try to keep the discussion to the minimum and uh, uh, try to get maximum out of these uh, interactions uh, you don't want that you are sitting for nine hours or ten hours for just discussing the risks. yes i know uh, the discussions can get, go very long but uh, try to resort to those tools and techniques which will consume less time and will give you more benefit so all the risks you have captured so far will be you know registered in in a risk register which is a, a kind of a long list of risks and you keep entering the risk under uh, uh, in that kind of a table you keep entering each risk in there naturally with uh, certain attributes for that risk maybe what uh, what is the name of the risk who is the, uh, who gave you this risk and um, uh, what department that person was from and who is the risk owner and what could be the probable response for this risk what is the probability of happening as much data as you can collect i am not asking you to fill all uh, all the attributes for each risk whatever attributes can be known uh, may be filled right at the source uh, otherwise the, just the name of the risk is enough and if the name of the risk is in proper cause risk effect format that is fantastic then we have the risk reports risk reports are uh, compiled uh, reports how the risk are categorized and how many risks are in what category and all then we have got the project documents updated as a result some further assumption log can be created some issue log can be generated and lessons learned register could be updated these are the things which are updated as a result of identification of the risk so this is a general run through for identification of risk and we will discuss more about each one of these things so 
let me ask you if you are okay with what, what I have talked about. Do you know? Yes, sir. Perfectly all right. Yeah. You can come Are you okay? Yes, sir. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, uh, if you look at it from uh, the diagram flow, or di flow diagram point of view, the same thing may look like this. This is also important because this is the diagram which actually shows you what is coming from where and what is going where exactly. Previously, in the previous diagram and table, you, you just know the inputs and tools and outputs, but you don't know what is coming from where and going where. Here exactly it shows that the project management plan along with these ingredients are coming from the process of developed project management plan. Uh, all of these documents are coming from the project documents. Then the project procurement management is giving you the procurement document. Agreements are coming from the conduct procurement. Enterprise and organization is giving you the enterprise environmental factors and organization process assets. Then the risk register and risk report you uh, after identification you are depositing to the project documents and what all is being updated you already had the assumption log you already had the issue log you already had the lessons learned register these three things are being updated and again going into the project documents so uh, you must look through if you are not really even if you are not really interested in this diagram but you must always look through this diagram and try to understand what is happening that will cement your understanding. Okay, now talking about the data analysis, let's talk each one of these topics. Uh, though I have briefly discussed each one of them, but let us uh, see what the book says. Root cause analysis is typically used to discover the underlying cause that lead to a problem and develop preventive action. It can be used to identify threats, threats are risks, by starting with a problem statement, for example, the project may be delayed or over budget. This is the problem start uh, st statement. And then exploring which threats might result in that problem occurring. So just the problem statement you have given me, uh, what could be the cause of that? The same technique can be used to find opportunities also by starting with a benefit first, a benefit statement like uh, early delivery are under budget and exploring which opportunities might result in that benefit being realized. So this is a good way of identifying risks uh, uh, just by doing the root cause analysis. Then we have assumptions and constraints analysis. Every project and its project management plan are conceived and developed based on a set of assumptions and within a series of constraints. These are often already incorporated in the scope baseline and project estimates. Assumptions and constraint analysis explores the validity of assumptions and constraints to determine which pose a risk to the project. So these assumptions and constraints are like, you know, uh, candidates to become risks. Threats may be identified from the inaccuracy, instability, inconsistency or incompleteness of assumptions if your assumptions were not taken correctly although assumption in itself is a risk but while you were taking the assumption if you were not accurate if you were not really stable about it not consistent or income you're not completely defined uh, the assumption then probably this increases the risk of assumption constraints may give rise to opportunities through removing or relaxing a limiting factor that affects the execution of project or process. This is a very interesting, interesting phenomena where there is, a, there is a positive negativity. There is a positivity. So when you have a problem, you have an opportunity to fix the problem and improve the system. So constraints may give rise to some kind of opportunities and you would know that these are the constraints. And if I can somehow remove this constraint, I can benefit this way. Sort analysis. Technique examines the project from each of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats perspective. For risk identification, it is used to increase the breadth of identified risks by including 
internally generated risks. The technique starts with the identification of strengths and weaknesses of the organization, focusing on either the project organization or the business area in general. SWOT analysis then identifies any opportunities for the project that may arise from strengths and any threats resulting from weaknesses. The analysis also examines the degree to which organizational strengths may offset threats and determine if weaknesses might hinder opportunities. Now, this is a very tricky kind of analysis, but very simple one. You see, what does, do we do? Actually, we take a large piece of paper and we divide that into four parts. On the top left quadrant, we say these are the strengths. Top right is the weaknesses. Bottom right quadrant is opportunities and bottom left quadrant is threats. Now we start identifying the strengths and weaknesses of the organization or for that matter, if we are doing it with the project, then the project, the strengths and weaknesses usually are internal to the organization. Opportunities or threats are usually external to the organization. So first we identify what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses. So when I am identifying the strengths, that will give me a clue for identifying the weaknesses because when I am considering my strengths, I also may remember some of the weaknesses and simultaneously I can write those weaknesses across on the other side of the paper where the weaknesses are to be written. But then do not write them in essay, just write them into small uh, phrases. So you can have a number, a number of strengths and number of weaknesses shown and then you move on to the opportunities and threats and once you are recognizing the opportunities, you may take a cue from your strengths and weaknesses and considering them, there will be some opportunities coming to your mind and naturally some threats coming to your mind and they will complement each other. Opportunities and threats will complement each other. Then is the time when you run the analysis. Once all the uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities have been identified, then you compare strengths with weaknesses, opportunities with threats. Strengths with opportunities and weaknesses with threats. Strengths with threats and weaknesses with opportunities. So it is a complete analysis how each one of these quadrants affect each other. So this is exactly what he defined here. So once you have done that, that would have given rise to a number of opportunities and threats which could be recognized. Document analysis. Risks may be identified from a structured view of project documents, including but not limited to the plans, assumptions, constraints, previous project files, contracts, agreements, and technical documentation, uncertainty or ambiguity in project documents, as well as inconsistencies within a document or between different documents may be indicators of risk on the project. Uh, just just remi reminds me, I was, uh, I was a judge recently, but recent, I am a judge on one of the international PMO uh, global contest and I had to judge between two PMOs one from Angola and one from South Africa so when I was looking at that I, I first I analyzed the Angola PM uh, PMO and I found it to be extremely inconsistent there were mistakes in that there were conceptual mistakes there were so many things on the other hand when I was watching the video of uh, South Africa and they're reading their documentation. That documentation wa looked like perfect to me. You know, it was so well formed, so well organized, so well presented, and uh, the concepts were, were so well understood that uh, the, there was no risk, absolutely no risk of not giving him any marks. So that I, I did give full marks to that PMO just because that PMO was definitely better. But the one which was carelessly written, that was, uh, you know, not properly formed or presented, that did not get any marks at all. All right. Information gathering techniques, I have already talked about them already, uh, though, uh, we can talk more, they can be even more than these 
uh, information gathering technique uh, we did talk about the brainstorming the goal of brainstorming is to obtain a comprehensive list of project risks the project team usually performs brainstorming often with a multidisciplinary set of experts who are not part of the team ideas about project risks are generated under the leadership of a facilitator either in a traditional free form brainstorm session or structured mass interviewing technique categories of risk such as in a risk breakdown structure can be used as a framework risk can be identified and categorized by type of risk and their definition are defined refined now it has not explained uh, brainstorming in much detail but it has hinted about it that it can be you know like you know uh, it says uh, projects are generated under the leadership of facilitator either in a traditional free form brainstorming session so this free form brainstorm session indicates the creativity part of it so he has actually mixed the creativity thing with the logic thing the categories of risks are provided free form uh, facilitation is provided in which ideas are coined to the group and group is asked to now think freely now this is the brainstorming thing which is which um, supports creativity out of the box thinking then is the delphi technique i hope you understand the delphi technique uh, khayam can you explain what do you mean and understand by the delphi technique so the delphi or the delphi technique is basically uh, when you have uh, you take input from experts anonymously without revealing the name of the people mm -hmm. uh, you found a problem you take their feedback and then until a consensus is reached you do many rounds mm -hmm. of this theme uh, so right. whatever inputs are similar you collect um, and when whichever points where there are like a few disagreements or mm -hmm. Uh, they need to come together you keep floating them and without revealing their names you collect consensus mm. on a problem base in most cases these are of technical nature the problem is of technical nature wonderful wonderful so uh, that is exactly the reason and um, uh, mohit can you tell me why do we need to keep these things anonymous uh, following a Del delphi technique yes uh, that is a prerequisite of the technique as well mm. so we yeah, are the the contributors names have to be uh, kept anonymously in order to uh, uh, maintain the impartiality of the the inputs being received mm -hmm. uh, so in order to remove those uh, biases prejudices or uh, like some uh, finger pointing within the departments or so on Mm -hmm. so that has to be kept anonymous yes i believe so wonderful wonderful uh, you are both very right actually what happens is when we are discussing something in a group and uh, no matter if the people are from the same department same organization or they are from different places uh, there is always a tendency of group think group think means that when people are sitting in a group they will somehow be influenced by a stronger personality and they will mold their ideas and way of thinking according to that person and ultimately they will stop giving their own ideas and start supporting the idea which is more forcefully given in the group so if they are from the same organization maybe they are all inclined to support their boss or whatever even if the boss is wrong they are going to support him this is conscious or unconscious effort this will always be there secondly naturally i do agree with mohit that there there is a lot of finger pointing and all that and uh, people can have grudges according accordingly so that point is also there so there is a need to keep uh, all the inputs anonymous how can we do that the traditional method is the delphi technique in which what we do is that we collect uh, the data anonymously from various sources we do not reveal the names of these people we just compile the list of all the ideas and share it with all who had given them the complete list is shared with all and then we ask for their comments and 
uh, then we share these the further compilation with again the same group and all, this goes on and on and on until all all the people are of the same view the objective of this technique is that we should create a consensus in a group which doesn't know each other so ultimately when a consensus is created amongst all then this technique uh, comes to an end but then this technique is a very lengthy technique this takes a lot of time people have come up with ideas where this delphi technique can be done on a much faster pace so uh, for strategy forming meetings for various other kinds of uh, data gathering in other ways other things uh, the, this is now being used uh, in a face to face meeting in which what they do is they give you the post it notes you understand the post it notes the post it notes uh, are given to you and you are asked to give your points uh, one point per post it note chit so you will write your 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 idea uh, in a small uh, uh, phrase on one piece of paper one idea second idea on another piece of paper so you will stick all these post it notes on a wall everybody will do that and their their stick uh, post it notes are then mixed together as if there is complete anonymity which point came from where and then those points are sorted out and sorted by the same people who actually are the audience they will actually uh, first of all the duplications are removed from there many ideas can be similar uh, many ideas can be extremely stupid so the same people will come and remove those, those ideas and ultimately the ideas which are left they are voted upon by these people everyone is given certain number of votes so uh, what uh, you can do is you can uh, give them stickers um, uh, of maybe some object like star so maybe i give you 10 stickers these are 10 stars so you are asked to vote on these 30 points so you may give all your votes to one point or you may distribute your votes among these 30 points in any any combination so everybody will vote and ultimately when all the votes have been casted the votes are counted the stars are counted against each point and whichever gets the maximum number of votes this is the list of 30 is sorted in that order and ultimately the uh, points which have got maximum votes maybe they are the top 10 the top 10 are chosen so you see the whole process of brainstorming or for that matter data gathering has been streamlined in our, this kind of a delphi technique then are the interviews uh, interviews are only conducted when qualitative data is uh, is required and when uh, the people who hold the data they are few and they can be uh, interviewed so this is much better if we can somehow uh, interview everybody because if few people are to be, uh, are there we can go to each one of them get the appointment with them and we can interview and collect as much as much data as we can, we want this will be a quality data we will get but in case they are more the people are more then probably we have to resort to other means like of focus groups or of workshops or even sometimes we will go for the questionnaires we float the questionnaire to the people and ask them but for identification of risk because we need specific risk this is not a good idea for questionnaires but naturally maximum we can go for a seminar root cause analysis is uh, a specific technique used to identify a problem discover the underlying cause that leads to it and develop a preventive action checklist analysis risk identification checklists are developed based on historical information and knowledge maybe from um, all the projects we have done before all the risks which had been there in those risks we have compiled a list of all the, those risks into a database and we created a checklist out of it and we can uh, use that checklist to check off check out those items which are present in my present project the lowest level of risk breakdown structure can also be used as a risk checklist if you already are 
having a risk breakdown structure in your organization, the lowest level is actually the one which you can apply and see um, what risks can occur, can occur in each one of those items. While a checklist may be quick and simple, it is impossible to build an exhaustive one. And care should be taken to ensure the checklist is not used to avoid the effort of proper risk identification. So this is not the only mean of collecting the data, uh, collecting, identifying the risks. So you must adopt more means, other means, as many means as you can possibly do in the time available. Teams should also explore items that do not appear on the checklist. Additionally, the checklist should be per, pruned from time to time to remove or achieve related items. You can improve the checklist. The checklist should be reviewed during project closure to incorporate new lessons learned from this project and improve it for use on future projects. So this is how our checklist analysis can be done. Assumptions, have, as I have explained earlier, every project and its plan is conceived and developed based on a set of hypotheses, scenarios, or assumptions. Assumptions analysis explores the validity of assumptions as they apply to the project. It identifies risks to the project from inaccuracy, instability, inconsistency, and incompleteness of the assumptions. Analyze each one of the risks for these flaws. For inaccuracy, instability, inconsistency, and incompleteness, and maybe we can improve the assumptions. Maybe we can identify certain risks out of it. So this could be a tool for risk identification. As far as the diagramming techniques are concerned, risk diagramming techniques may include the cause effect diagram that could you might uh, you are both pmps you you might know ishikawa cause effect diagram for fishbone this is exactly same thing we are talking about these are also known as ishikawa fishbone and are useful for identifying causes of risks system or process flow chart these show how various elements of the system interrelate and mechanism of causation how the things travel through the flow chart and then you can pinpoint where is the problem and naturally what risk is there and at what point so you can pinpoint it on a flow diagram in first diagram uh, also is a very useful way these are graphical representations of situations showing causal influences time ordering of events and other relationships among variables and outcomes just look at the diagram 11.7 i'll be showing just in a while let uh, okay let me first uh, where is it okay this is missing that diagram is missing i'll i'll show you some from somewhere else okay uh, swot analysis uh, we have already described it this technique examines the project from each of the strengths weaknesses and opportunities and threats perspective to increase the breadth of identified risk by including internally generated risk techniques start with identification of strengths weaknesses this i explained to you and this is how it may look like in SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The boxes are made, and then uh, the items uh, are identified for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and written in point form under the strengths or weaknesses or opportunities or threats. Then, once we have them, then we analyze. We can build on certain strengths to mitigate certain threats. We can eliminate certain weaknesses to exploit certain opportunities. So. Things like that, we can correlate the strengths with weaknesses, opportunities with threats, strengths with opportunities, weaknesses with threats, strengths with threats, weaknesses with opportunities, and therefore, out of this huge analysis, we can come up with a number of risks. Now, let's talk about some critical success factors about the identification of risk. Risk identification should be performed as early as possible in the project life cycle. Recognizing the paradox that uncertainty is high in initial stages of a project, so there is often less information on which to base the risk identification. Early risk identification enables key project decisions to take maximum account of risk inherent in the project and may result in changes to the project strategy. If there is a need for changing the strategy of the project, we can do it early on. It also maximizes the time available 
for development and implementation of risk responses, which enables enhances in efficiency since responses taken early are often normally less costly than later ones. Since not so this was the first one was about the early identification. So this is to support the cause uh, identify the risk as soon as possible. So early identification is first critical success factor in identify risk process. Second one is iterative identification. As we said, we need to keep doing this identification process till the project ends. Since not all risk can be identified at any given point in the project, it is essential that risk identification is repeated throughout the project lifecycle. This should be done periodically at a frequent frequency determined during the plan risk management process or which I told you earlier at specific events also. But so far I am talking about the iteration. Therefore, a periodic frequency must be established. So this is for iteration of the identification. Risk identification might also be repeated as key milestones in the project or whenever there is significant change that is incident based. Then we have emergent identification that is for unknown unknowns which suddenly become uh, become un, uh, become known right before they are about to blast. In addition to invoking the identifier risk process and defined in the project plan, the risk plan risk management process should permit risks to be identified at any time, not limited to formal risk identification event or regular regular web reviews. So risks could be identified by anyone at any time. Do not wait for the specific event to occur or specific periodicity to occur. Just as soon as a risk becomes visible, you can jot it down in the risk register and thus emergent risk can be identified very quickly and responded to. Comprehensive identification means the broad range of sources of risk should be considered to ensure that as many uncertainties as possible that might affect objectives have been identified. So like you know uh, proper format and details about all the details which can be secured about that risk must be must be identified and all the prob probable sources of that risk must also be pointed out. <clears throat> then is explicit identification of opportunities as we identify threats and we are more inclined towards identifying the threats we must give some time always to identify the opportunities. The identify risk process should ensure opportunities are properly considered. Therefore, in every risk identification process, let us divide it into two parts. Maybe you start with opportunities first and then you go on to threats. Do not mix them both and especially when you are trying to have the normal progress update meeting along with the, prog uh, the, the project risk meeting, if that is the case, then after the progress meeting, you must start the risk meeting with opportunities and once the opportunities have been discussed, then you can move on to threat and that will also uh, handle the change of mood. Multiple perspectives. Identify risk process should take input from a broad range of project stakeholders to ensure that all perspectives are presented and considered. Do not take a risk just from one stakeholder's uh, mouth. If a stakeholder has given a risk which is uh, uh, not really very reliable, you can share that risk with many other stakeholders and ask their view about it. Uh, that risk may either be confirmed or not confirmed. And even if it is confirmed, then it could be, uh, it would have even better reasoning to be included in the risk register. Limiting risk identification to the immediate project team is unlikely to expose all knowable risks. So involve as many stakeholders as possible. Risks linked to project objectives. This is again very important because we must be concerned about the scope, time and cost and sometimes the quality. Each identified project risk should relate to at least one of the project objectives, one or more. <clears throat> Noting that the PMBOK defines risk as an uncertain event or condition that if, if it occur occurs 
has a positive or negative effect on the project objectives and those are scope time cost and sometimes quality consideration of each project objective during the identifier risk process will assist in identifying risks noting that some risks may affect more than one objective so this is about linking the risks to the objectives then the complete risk statement cause risk and effect identified risks should be clearly and unambiguously described so that they can be understood by those responsible for risk assessment and risk response planning single words or phrases like resources logistics resources what what is the risk res uh, called resources what is the risk called logistics this these are inadequate and do not properly communicate the nature of the risk more detailed risk description are required which explicitly state the uncertainty, its cause, and its effect. We'll talk more about that, but uh, for time being, uh, ownership and level of detail. When a risk is identified, your, you must identify a risk owner along with it. And to the level of detail, it has to be explored. The risk can be identified at a number of levels of detail. A generalized or high level description of risk can make it difficult to develop responses and assign ownership. While describing risk in a lot of detail can create a great deal of work. So do not do either of the, those things. Try to do it appropriately. The right level of detail you must uh, identify for that risk and assign somebody responsible for it, a risk owner. Each risk should be described at a level of detail at which it can be assigned to a single risk owner with clear responsibility and accountability for its management. Trigger conditions should also be identified where this is possible and appropriate. So trigger conditions are when this risk is about to come or it becomes dangerous for your environment, what is the trigger for that? And to have a trigger, you must have a sensor also. Who, who and how will it be sensed that the risk is nearing and when the risk is nearing how will, would i know that risk is nearing this is a trigger maybe somebody tells me somebody rings a bell or something like that that would be a trigger condition objectivity all human activities are susceptible to bias especially when dealing with uncertainty so here we must understand we must talk objectively not subjectively there are people are uh, people who are telling you the risks they have their own biases what kind of biases can be there there could be a motivational bias there could be a cognitive bias motivational biases where someone is trying to bias the result in one direction or another that is intentional motivational bias is intentional like you are working in a team and to protect your team, to absolve your team from some responsibility, you are trying to affect the results by, change, by giving your opinion in a specific biased direction. Thus, saving yourself and your team from extra work. So this is kind of a motivational bias. I would say this is intentional, but it may not be with a negative purpose. But still, it is a bias and it is going to affect your results. So we don't like it. Motivational bias should be reduced, should be eliminated rather. Then there is yet another type of bias, bias that is called cognitive bias. These are the biases which occur as people are using their best judgment and applying heuristics. People are not intentionally trying to bend the results. but based on their knowledge they believe something to be true which is actually not true like you see uh, we uh, we use heuristics the thumb rules that my father had told me that this thing must be mixed with this thing to make it effective so this is a heuristic which has no proof but you and your family have been using it for hundreds of years and you think that this will give you the certain result which it is which it will not so this you are not saying something wrong 
but this is not based on actually the true value which you are believing it to be true that is a cognitive bias and if you find this kind of bias it also has to be eliminated <clears throat> this should be explicitly recognized and addressed during the identify risk process sources of bias should be exposed wherever possible and their effect on the risk process should be managed proactively the aim is to minimize subjectivity so these these, the, these biases will give me subjective data and allow open and honest identification of as many risks as possible to the project and try to make it more objective <clears throat> so these were the critical success factors 10 critical success factors for identify risk process now uh, we have already talked about the tools but still uh, let's talk about uh, the tools from another perspective that is all the tools uh, for risk management for risk identification could be categorized into three categories past present and future from the past we get the historical review historical information lessons learned all this will help us to identify certain kinds of risks then from present i could base my decision or my identification of risk based on some current assessment some analysis some calculation some mathematic some probability so i may identify certain risks so this is based on present category and future that is something which i don't know and which i presume that this may happen this is this can only be explored through creativity techniques what if this happens what will we do what if that happens what will we do so that is exploring the future so let us talk about each one of these historical review are based on what occurred in the past either on this project or other similar projects in the same organization are comparable projects in other organizations historical review approaches rely on careful selection of comparable situations which are genuinely similar to the current project and filtering of data to ensure that only relevant previous risks are considered in each case the risks identified in the selected historical situation should be considered asking whether similar risks might arise in this project so this is historical then coming over to the present current assessment relying on detailed consideration of the current project analyzing its characteristics against given frameworks and models in order to expose areas of uncertainty so i am living in present analyzing all the possible data and ultimately coming coming up with uncertainties unlike historical review approaches current assessment techniques do not rely on outside reference points but are based purely on examination of the current project then are the creativity techniques that are for the future a wide range of creativity techniques can be used for risk identification which encourages project stakeholders to use their imagination thinking out of the box to find risks which might affect the project the outcomes are effects of these techniques depend on the ability of the participant to think creatively these techniques can be used either singly or in groups and employ varying degrees of structure these techniques depend on the ability of the participant to think creatively and their success in is enhanced by use of skilled facilitators so if a good facilitator is there which was mentioned earlier earlier also uh, when we were talking about the brainstorming there was a facilitator a skilled facilitator so skilled facilitator can guide your creativity he can point you in certain direction and then you all can start thinking in that direction each category of risk identification techniques has strengths and weaknesses and no single technique can be expected to reveal all knowable risks consequently the identify risk process for a particular project should use a combination of techniques perhaps selecting one from each category for example 
a project may choose to use a risk identification checklist which is a historical review together with assumption analysis which is a current assessment and brainstorming which is creativity so you can use all these things together for identification of your risk or you can use a risk breakdown structure which organizes the categories of potential risk on the project a prompt list or a set of generic list categories may assist in ensuring that as many sources of risk as practicable have been addressed while recognizing that no two such tools are complete nor can they replace original thinking so these are just aids these are just tools you can come up with your own tools or techniques which may be completely different from what you have been taught here but still you can identify further risk whichever risk identifying techniques are used it is important that identified risks are unambiguously described in order to ensure that the project risk process is focused on the actual risk and not distracted or diluted by non risk you must be focused you you must be concise you should not start you know unnecessary discussion on uh, uh, non risks use of structured risk descriptions can ensure clarity you know cause risk effect format that is also called risk meta language cause risk effect is risk meta language offers a useful way of distinguishing a risk from its cause and effect describing each risk using a three part statement the first part comma second part comma third part first part is the cause second part is the risk and the third part is the effect so the statement could be like as a result of course risk might occur which may lead to this effect so this way you can have a concise and complete kind of a risk statement so the relationship of cause risk effect is like cause leads to risk leads to effect and cause could be a fact or condition risk is the uncertainty the uncertainty is in the risk not in the cause or in the effect and effect is the possible result so uncertainty is the risk <clears throat> to try to understand what your risk really is finally you document these results the results of the identify risk process should be recorded in order to capture all relevant information currently available for each identified risk the main output from the identify risk process is the risk register and naturally the risk reports according to the sixth edition this includes a properly structured risk description and a nominated risk owner so at least every risk identified should be naturally in the risk statement format and should have a nominated risk owner if not anything else other attributes if available can be filled in for each risk and may also include other information can be the cause and effect of the risk register the trigger the condition the sensor preliminary response and so on and so forth you can have as many um, attributes attached to it as many attributes can be gathered uh, when the risks are identified that is always useful but minimum i must have a risk and a risk owner so that brings me to the end of risk identification uh, i don't know if you are really um, satisfied with it you have understood everything uh, ji na yes sir any question i'm comfortable as well yes sir uncomfortable nahi comfortable sir <laughs> okay <laughs> so any any doubts or anything um, which is not clear i think i tried to make everything absolutely clear still if you have any doubt you are welcome to ask sir so uh, it would mean that the identify risk process the biggest output is not actually the long list of risks but mm -hmm. actually the understanding of the risks that you have identified not really not really. That... you see i said that the attributes are optional hmm. try to get as many attributes as possible but the primary hmm. focus is to identify as many risks as possible hmm. in the way if you can somehow get all the attributes well and good if not 
then at least you must have the risk owner listed against each risk. Even if it is not in a risk for a statement format, there is no problem. Just write down the risk and write the risk owner. This is the minimum data you should provide. Mm. But if you are comfortable, you can, uh, you are precise, you probably can get as many attributes as possible. But long list is my desire. Okay, sir. understood. So you can read through this and uh, maybe if you have any doubts, we can uh, discuss it tomorrow before we start the next session. Next two sessions, the qualitative and quantitative may take a little more time, maybe two lectures each or something like that. We will go through it and we will see, uh, but uh, nothing is more difficult now. You know, we have already talked a lot about uh, uh, things in uh, uh, risk management planning. We did talk about a lot many things which we have to talk in qualitative analysis and even quantitative analysis. So it is better to, you know, I think we are going smooth. You won't have any much problem. Wonderful, sir. Okay, if you, you do not have anything else to talk about, uh, probably we can leave now, we can uh, have a break and we can again see each other tomorrow. I have uploaded all the details uh, uh, on uh, on the YouTube also and on the OneDrive and uh, uh, I will give you the fresh links right now. Uh, this is it. So please uh, note down these links. Uh, yesterday, whatever I sent may may not be may not be very right. Uh, some somebody told me that I sent a wrong link, probably to you or to the other class. But these are the right links. First first one is uh, the video link. At this link, you will find all the lectures till yesterday. I will upload this one tomorrow. And in the PM, PMI RMP material from my OneDrive, you can download uh, a huge list of, uh, of files. And let me show you how do they look like. This is the PMI RMP. Okay, sir. It is being uploaded. Uh, let me show you from. Okay. Okay. Can you see this? Uh, there is one folder as PMI RMP exam questions. Yes, sir. Uh, there are at least two to three full size papers in there. Okay, that's wonderful. Then you have got uh, RMP handbooks, which include the um, standards, books, uh, standards. Uh, PMP handbook, uh, course outline, and all that. Then there is RMP material. RMP material is, I have a, get a collection of a lot of uh, material from various people, um, very famous people, and uh, their books and their material and their, whatever notes they had gathered, they all are there in this material. If you want to go into it, you will see. Here you have got ICE, RAMP articles, Jeff, Jeff Hodgkinson is a very famous man. Um, he holds all the certifications of PMI. Jeff's material is there. Some miscellaneous material is there. Then specific to risk communication, risk governance, risk management plan, risk tools, there are certain materials and articles available here. This is beyond what I have told you. What I am teaching you, this is all beyond that. So if you want to learn more in detail, you can go for it. Then uh, I, my old presentations, which are not fresh, they are in this folder. And uh, these are the various risk management books, different books, electronic books. These are all listed here. These are many books here. So you can you can read through anyone you like. And uh, these are the presentations I'm talking about. The first presentation, the very first day was 00, module 00, and the remaining all, all presentations till the end are in this last file. 
so this is all uh, is included in it and you you can download it from here and uh, this uh, i think you have more than what uh, you can chew so you will definitely <laughs> pass your certification <laughs> inshallah sir perfect sir okay ji then uh, let's call sir, for the uh, uh, i have an announcement to make for the next uh, uh three days i won't be able to join the session there is a planning meeting going on for okay. one of our project in Tor toronto so right. i might not be available but i would uh, catch up the pace okay. while watching your youtube lectures and so on so yeah so what uh, means on uh, what else can friday i will probably be here what else can we do can we shift the time uh, some other uh, plus minus which is suitable to both of you because basically uh, both of you are there and shahid is there so tell me your suitable time maybe we can try that time sir i can propose uh, yeah because shahid is not here so i'm not sure that if you can all agree but uh, the the time you propose for like one of your class for pgmp also so morning that time. was a very good time the morning five. time from 5 to 7 so if you are able to make it so what is that time? not what is that time from your uh, uh, time scale so that is uh, around uh, 8 to 10 pm okay uh, khayam what do you say can we shift these classes for 2 3 days to 5 to 7 am 5 to 7 am ah huh. early morning uh, after sir sir ji chale theek hai so the next two days we can do it after sorry yes what you get done with the iftari and all uh, get about that I mean, yeah. many of their people the people have their like speaking uh, sleeping schedule uh -huh. at that time <laughs> we, uh, we will check with shahid and if he after a few days yeah if shahid can be available there is no problem we'll do it but i think i think For I think, earlier, sir. Uh, I think his yeah. time it would be the seri time. It would be the seri time. Yeah, he, I he think. It's, it's, it two hours earlier. Uh, that means three to uh, three to five, exactly the seri time, na? Yes, sir. मैं ये भी नहीं चाहता कि हम ऑफिस में जाकर और सोते रहे और मुझे बदवाएं देते रहे बाद में नहीं नहीं आजकल हमारे पास भी लकी जी इतना काम नहीं है तो आई कैन ऑलवेज स्लीप आई हैव अ सेपरेट रूम है देख हम ऐसे करते हैं कि वी प्लान फॉर इवनिंग वेट इन नॉर्मल टाइम बट इफ देयर इज अ चेंज देन आई लेट यू नो ऑल थ्री ऑफ यू एंड वी विल अकॉर्डिंगली सेट इट बट फॉर ऑल प्रैक्टिकल पर्पस वी विल मीटिंग सेम टाइम परफेक्ट सर सर वो एक बस आप ये हमें लिंक अभी चैट पे भेजेंगे या आप ईमेल करेंगे ये मैंने चैट पे भेज दिया ना ठीक है चलिए लिंक करें वंडरफुल थैंक यू सर थैंक यू ओके जी टेक केयर खुदा हाफिज थैंक यू सर हम सर लाफो